60 Minutes Rewind. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong stepped out of an odd-looking spaceship and into the pages of history as the first man on the moon. Today, he remains one of the most famous people on the planet. But he's also famously private. For years, Armstrong has shunned the media and the limelight, but now he's about to take a giant leap back into the public view. He's finally authorized a biography entitled First Man, written by James Hansen. And for the first time, he's agreed to a television profile. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Oh, boy. Walter Cronkite captured the moment. Here we got a roll program. Building shaking. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. What did it feel it like? It felt like a train on a bad railroad track and shaking in every direction. <laughs> and it was loud, really loud. Neil Armstrong is 75 now, an aging hero, but his winning smile is still there. We remember him as the cool and confident commander of Apollo 11, joined by his crewmates, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. On a windswept day, we went with Armstrong to an old Apollo launch pad at Kennedy Space Center to hear the story of one of man's greatest adventures. That July morning in 1969 when you came out and you gave that thumbs up, that was a very confident view you put on. Yeah, it was a little bit of a sham, I admit. <laughs> uh, you know, the reality is a lot of times you get up there and get in the cockpit and something goes wrong somewhere and you go back down. So actually, when you actually lift off, it's really a big surprise. <laughs> Perched atop a Saturn V rocket, they were on their way to meet the challenge President Kennedy made eight years earlier. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. It took 400,000 workers and $24 billion intended in large part to prove American superiority over the Soviets. There was a lot riding on that mission, wasn't there? It was the hopes of a nation riding on that mission. It was indeed. We wanted to do well. Even more than that, you, you hope that uh, you don't, you as a person don't make any mistakes. And he didn't. Armstrong's entire life had prepared him well, starting with a childhood fascination with flight. He earned his pilot's license at 16 before he learned to drive. By 21, he was flying combat missions over Korea. After the war, he became a hotshot test pilot, flying the famous X-15 at 4,000 miles an hour to the edge of the atmosphere. It was during that time in 1962 when he faced his most difficult test, losing his two-year-old daughter Karen to brain cancer. Did that affect your work at that time? Some people, when they're hit with a tragedy like that, they pour themselves into their work. Yeah. It's, it's difficult for me to, to know. Uh, I, uh, I thought the best thing for me to do in that situation was to uh, continue with my work, keep things as normal as, as I could, and uh, try as hard as I could not to, uh, not to have it affect affect my ability to do useful things. But that's not an easy thing to do. How do you think you did? Uh, at the time, I thought the family was handling it well and I was, uh, I was doing the best I could. You never quite recover from the death of a child. In that same year of grief, Armstrong was chosen to be an astronaut. He flew his first space mission in 1966 on Gemini 8 and nearly lost his life when his tiny capsule briefly spun out of control. He cheated death again two years later while flying an experimental device designed to simulate a lunar landing. When it malfunctioned, Armstrong was sitting at the controls. He ejected barely 100 feet from the ground. And if you didn't get out, that would have been your life. Um, yeah, probably would have. Yet somebody told me that after that happened, when it was all over, you went back to your office and sat down to do paperwork. 
that's that's true. I, I did. There was there was work to be done. Wait a minute. You were just almost killed. <laughs> well, but I wasn't. Armstrong stood out, even among a class of astronauts that had the right stuff. His depth of experience and nerves of steel earned him at age 38 the command of Apollo 11. The trip to the moon took four days. After achieving lunar orbit, Michael Collins would remain in the command module while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin climbed into the lunar module, undocked, and began their descent. Zero, zero, seven, six, four. But the landing took an unexpected turn. The onboard guidance system was sending Armstrong and Aldrin right towards disaster. Our autopilot was taking us into a very large crater about the size of a, a big football stadium with steep slopes on the crater covered with very large rocks about the size of automobiles. That was not the kind of place I wanted to try to make the first landing. Armstrong overrode the autopilot and looked for a safe place to land. But the detour cost them precious fuel and they were about to run out. A worldwide television audience of nearly a billion people was on the edge of their seats. And so was CBS's own Walter Cronkite. We couldn't resist reuniting the former anchorman with the former spaceman. There are things they can laugh about now, but at the time, those final seconds were almost unbearable. Uh, we were following the flight plan, and uh, we suddenly realized that he'd made a, a detour, and uh, we didn't know how long that detour was going to be. Yes, I was very much concerned. I think all of us who were following the uh, flight that closely were scared to death. Uh, if, if he wasn't, we were. 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. The Eagle closed in on the moon. Houston, uh, and then this. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Oh, boy. Boy. <laughs> okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. Walter was breathing again, too, but barely. You are a man who I've known for years never to be at a loss for words, but you were at a loss for words then. I, <laughs> I think all you could come up with was, oh, boy. Turned out I didn't have anything to say at all, <laughs> except, whoa, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> Perfectly speechless. The ghostly image was beyond words. Armstrong paused on the bottom rung of the ladder. I'm going to step off the limb and planted his left boot on the lunar dust. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Do you recall how you came up with that? A small step for a man. What was the inspiration for it? Well, I thought, well, when I step off, it's just going to be a little step. It's going to be a step from there down to there. But then I thought about, all those 400,000 people that had given me the opportunity to make that step and thought, it's, it's, it's going to be a big something for all those folks and indeed a lot of others that even weren't even involved in the project. So it was a, a, a kind of a simple correlation of thoughts. The pictures that came back were quite remarkable. What did it look like to you, to your naked eye? It's uh, it's a brilliant surface in that sunlight. The horizon seems quite close to you because the curvature is so much more pronounced than here on Earth. It's an interesting uh, place to be. I, I recommend it. <laughs> hey, that's something. Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent desolation. Armstrong and Aldrin spent just a short time on the lunar surface, testing the gravity, completing a long list of experiments, and marking their journey. They had come in peace for all mankind, but stayed less than a day. God bless you. Good night from Apollo 11. The hard part was re-entry. They returned to Earth superstars. In New York, four million people showered them with ticker tape. On a 45-day victory lap around the world, they were met by crowds in the Congo and by the Queen at Buckingham Palace. But as Armstrong reveals in his new biography published by our sister company, Simon & Schuster, he was unprepared for his sudden celebrity and found it to be both a blessing and a burden. 
friends and colleagues all of a sudden uh, looked at us uh, or treated us uh, slightly differently than they had months or years before when we were working together. I never quite understood that. <laughs> you said once to a reporter, how long must it take before I cease to be known as a space man? Why did you make that comment? I guess we all like to be recognized not for one uh, piece of fireworks, but for the ledger of our daily work. The story will continue after this. Strolling around the Ohio farm where he was born, Armstrong is easy to talk to but hard to know. He can seem guarded, but above all, we were struck by his humility. You sometimes seem uncomfortable with your celebrity, that you'd rather not have all of this attention. No, I just don't deserve it. <laughs> but look, how many people have walked on the moon? Twelve? You were the first. You were chosen to do that. That's special. Yeah, I wasn't chosen to be first. I was just chosen to command that flight. Circumstance put me in that particular role. That wasn't planned by anyone. After Apollo 11, Armstrong hung up his spacesuit and never felt the need for an encore. For eight years, he taught engineering at the University of Cincinnati, surely their only professor who'd walked on the moon. In the midst of all your professional achievements, you managed to get married, to have a family. Was it a difficult balance for you to maintain both sides of your life? The one thing I regret was that my my work required an enormous amount of my time and a lot of travel and I didn't get to spend the time I would have liked with my family as they were growing up. Armstrong has two sons with his wife of 38 years, Janet, who divorced him in 1994. He remarried several years ago. In the autumn of his life, he lives very much in the present, refusing to let his famous deed define him. He's made a comfortable living serving on corporate boards, but even in retirement, he keeps a watchful eye on the space program and would like to see it restored to its glory days. Did you ever imagine that five years after first going to the moon that we'd abandon the Apollo program? I knew we would have a, a limited life, but I must say it, it was a bit shorter than my expectation. I fully expected that by the end of the century, we would have achieved substantially more than we actually uh, did. And why do you think we didn't? When we lost the competition, we lost the public will to continue. Very good. The man who once rode a 160 million horsepower rocket now flies this, a plane with no engine. If you're wondering how Neil Armstrong gets his thrills today, just watch. Gliders, sailplanes, they're wonderful uh, flying machines. It's the closest you can come to being a bird. What do you get out of gliding? Self-satisfaction, a sense of uh, accomplishment, trying to do a little better than you think you possibly can. NASA recently announced plans to send men back to the moon by the year 2018 and later to Mars. Don't think Neil Armstrong hasn't noticed. You said you'd like to see us go back to the moon and then go on to Mars. Something you want to do at this point in your life? I don't think I'm going to get the chance, but I don't want to say I'm not available. <laughs>